you probably have trained hundreds, if not thousands of deep neural networks. One of the most common operations that happens inside a deep neural network is matrix multiplication. Have you ever stopped and wondered what might be actually going on inside a GPU when you train, when you perform matrix multiplication? If you want to learn about that, that's what we'll be discussing today. Now, wait just one second. Why do we even need to know about these things? Don't deep learning frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow already take care of this? That's a great question. They do. But there are several reasons you might still want to know what might be going under the hood. Reason number one. Though we take these CUDA kernels implemented underneath for granted, they might not be the most efficient. For example, a recent paper called Flash Attention showed that most of the computations that happen during self-attention are actually memory bound and not compute bound, which means the GPU is actually spending a lot of time transferring memory than doing computations. By understanding the hierarchy of memory inside a GPU, they were able to scale up transformers so that they can take sequences up to 64,000 long. To put that into perspective, an average adult fiction novel would contain about 70,000 to 100,000 words. So, by better understanding GPUs, this enabled us to scale transfer models from taking one paragraph at a time to take entire novel at a time. There are lesser known facts about GPUs such as having your matrix dimensions in power of 2 usually makes the computations more efficient. By the end of this video, you will understand exactly why this is the case. Reason number three, fusing two kernels together as opposed to calling one kernel after the other is more efficient for the GPU. Again, by the end of the video, you will know exactly why. So with that little motivation, let's get started. But before we begin, just to give some context here, we're talking about NVIDIA GPUs and CUDA implementations. For the numbers I will be showing you for various specifications, they will be based on the NVIDIA GPU A100. In CUDA, the matrix multiplication is called GEM or Generalized Matrix Multiplication. The equation for GEM is C equals A multiplied by A dot B plus B multiplied by C. Here, A dot B represents the actual matrix multiplication. A is an M by K matrix, B is an K by N matrix, so that gives us an M by N matrix at the end. We're just going to focus on the matrix multiplication, so we can keep the conversation simple. And that's the core part of the computation that's happening within a gem. The naive way to compute a matrix multiplication is using three for loops. You iterate through the rows of A, which is denoted by I. You iterate through the columns of B, which is denoted by J. And for each row and each column, you compute the dot product by iterating each element, which is denoted by K. When you do the computation like this, for every single row that's loaded from A, you need to load all the columns in B. To have some numbers around this statement, let's say you have a matrix A which is 10 by 20 and say you have a matrix B which is 20 by 30. At the end of the matrix multiplication between A and B, the columns of B are loaded 10 times 30, which is 300 times. You might be thinking, why is that a problem? To understand why that's a problem, you need to understand the GPU memory hierarchy. Here, I'm showing the memory hierarchy for an A100. You have a global memory of 40 gigabytes, but that's not the only level of memory you have in a GPU. You have shared memory and register files. Apart from this, you also have caches, but I'm gonna ignore the caches for the simplicity of our talk. In GPUs, one of the main computation units you have is a streaming multiprocessor. In an A100, you have 108 streaming multiprocessors. 
For each streaming multiprocessor, you have a shared memory, which is about 164 kilobytes in this case. And then within each multiprocessor or SM, you have processing blocks. Each processing block has a set of register files. In this case, the register would be about 64 kilobytes. So the first thing to notice is that the shared memory and the register files are way smaller than the global memory. This gives us a nice entry why the aforementioned column loading is a problem. In order for the computation to happen, the actual data needs to travel from the global memory to shared memory and then onto the register files. So if you have lots and lots of data loading, your computations is going to be mostly memory bound and not compute bound. So your GPU is actually exchanging memory rather than doing the compute. This is known as memory thrashing. This brings us to the trick number one. If you play around with the looping structure we have, turns out you can actually get a really nice formulation where we are loading only one column of A and one row of B at a time. The idea is you take the loop which goes through K as the outermost loop. You can see in the animation, we only load one column of A and one row of B only once. But there's still a problem. As you saw, the shared memory and the register files inside an SM is quite small. What if we can't fit the entire row or entire columns of A and B inside these? Is there a way to load an arbitrary block from A and B and do the computation iteratively and still get the answer? I'm glad you asked. That brings us to the second trick. GPUs execute tasks using tens of thousands of threads. So, if you can break your matrix multiplication into smaller bits, we can do the matrix multiplication quite fast. In CUDA, this is known as tiling. You can perform the matrix multiplication using tiling. The idea is, in order to compute a block inside C, which is the final answer, you only need a single strip from A, which is denoted by the light blue strip, and a single strip from B, which is denoted by the yellow strip in B. Then you can load a single block within that strip at a time, compute the output, and accumulate the output over and over again for different blocks in that strip. This will give you the same exact answer if you were to load the entire row and entire column at once. Here's what the actual code might look like when you have this timing concept incorporated into your code. It's a few more for loops, but we're doing the same amount of work as before. But GPUs don't stop there. They actually have multiple levels of execution in them, so they keep breaking the problem into smaller and smaller pieces. In order to understand how that works, you now need to understand how a task is executed within a GPU. We discussed that the GPU consists of several streaming multiprocessors, or SMs. Each SM executes a thread block. A thread block is a collection of threads. And within each thread block, the threads are organized into something called warps. A warp is a collection of 32 threads. And within each warp, you have a single thread. A100s can have a maximum of 1024 threads per block. It can have 2048 threads per SM and 32 thread blocks per SM. Within these confinements, you can find a certain configuration of thread blocks and threads to run your computation load. There's also this heuristic. Having a matrix tile of 256128 is quite efficient for GPUs. Remember the second reason I told you that GPUs are more efficient with powers of 2? This is where that comes from. Since the GPU is breaking your problem into tiles of 256 by 128, when your matrix has dimensions of power of 2, that allows the GPU to properly divide your 
properly divide your matrix into a certain number of tiles. And that makes the GPU is quite efficient. So with that, the GPU can keep breaking your problem into smaller and smaller pieces. If the GPUs are quite efficient when the matrix dimensions are power of two, what happens when they are not? The concept that takes place is known as tile quantization. Say you have a tile size of 128 by 128. If you have a matrix of size 256 by 256, then you can fill four thread blocks fully using your data. But what if we have a 256 by 257 matrix? You will need two additional thread blocks. The problem with this is that the thread block needs to do the same amount of computation regardless of how much data you have in it. So the last two thread blocks are doing a lot of unnecessary computations on the data just because it spilled a tiny bit into those thread blocks. And this makes the GPUs slightly more inefficient when you have data that is not divisible by your tile size. Now let's talk about trick number three. In the beginning, I mentioned to you that it's faster to do the computations in a single kernel than to do the computation in two kernels, one after the other. So in deep neural networks, if you, if you have certain common operations that happens right after matrix multiplication, it makes sense to combine these. For example, adding the bias or applying ReLU. If you don't combine these common operations into one kernel, what's going to happen is one kernel is going to write your data into global memory. Then the next kernel needs to retrieve that data back from the global memory into this shared file shared memory or the registers and then write it back again and the next kernel will bring the data back in. So again you see this problem of exchanging data as opposed to doing actual computations but if you do all the computations in a single kernel then your data doesn't need to leave this multiprocessor until after all the computations are done. That brings us to the end of this talk. In conclusion, by knowing how these GPUs actually do the number crunching under the hood, it will make your models quite efficient. And when they're not, it will quickly explain to you why they're not. We discussed a few tricks. The first one is doing matrix multiplication with less memory retrievals. We also talked about how we can divide and conquer the matrix multiplication by loading arbitrary sized blocks of data and dividing the computation between thread blocks, warps, and individual threads. Finally, we talked about how kernel fusion can make your computations more efficient. I hope you found this video useful. If you're interested in learning about new topics of machine learning, go ahead and subscribe to my channel, Deep Learning Hero. I will see you soon with another video.